Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan, and I'm going to zero in on the use case, as always, for XRP, because at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. And I want to look at liquidity. Why is it important for XRP to have liquidity? And where do we see it taking off? as a use case and what does the future hold? We're gonna hear from a Ripple employee, someone who's been there for a very long time. But first, I wanna give a brief example on liquidity because for some of you, it might be a little blurry. And the example I'm gonna give, I hope you can easily understand because we're gonna talk about the shares of Ripple. They have issued shares of the company to previous employees, current employees, and also to early investors. But they are basically illiquid, meaning they're very difficult to sell. And because they have not IPO'd, people are looking for ways to find liquidity, a place to sell. That's why we see a rise of these pre-IPO secondary market platforms. The IPOs have been really slow to be realized recently because of the unsure market conditions. And also too, there's a trend of delaying to IPO, mainly to build the valuations. Worldwide, there are 475 unicorn companies. Those are private companies valued over at $1 billion, and Ripple is one of those. So you can imagine there's a lot of illiquid stock out there. So these platforms are providing some liquidity, a place to easily sell. Last March, I did a video on just one such company. It is called Equity Zen. They're one of the more established companies uh, for making these shares available as a financial instrument. It's not a place where you can actually get the shares, but it's a place where you can invest in a fund that is a representation of all those shares. And then you can invest in the Ripple stock in this way, but uh, you need to be sure you have a accredited investor uh, qualification. And usually it takes about a $10,000 minimum investment. That's what about a dozen of these companies are requiring. And in June, uh, you can see that this company, Equity Zen, made the top 100 most promising technology pioneers of 2020 recognized by the World Economic Forum. So they really are, um, providing a service that is very much needed. So I also want to show you on their front splash page, they provide holders of the shares, primarily tech companies, a way to get liquidity, to sell their stock. And not having to wait for an IPO for some is really what they need to do. You never know why somebody wants to sell. Maybe they want to build a house. Uh, maybe they have kids to put into college. You just don't know uh, why. But you have to keep some things in mind. Okay, if you invest in one of these funds, you're holding something that then becomes a little bit illiquid. Uh, it only becomes liquid if the company wants to IPO or does IPO. That provides you a clear exit. And also, too, remember that if a company receives another round of funding while you're holding that fund, you're going to see some dilution, which means your percentage of ownership is decreased. So that is a little bit of a risk. Now, granted, when a company goes through a round of funding, the valuation of that company increases, but you still are going to reduce the percentage of ownership. And if the company does go public, you still will most likely find yourself in a lockup period, usually one year. But of course, that differs from platform to platform. And what if the company doesn't IPO? Well, that's the risk you take. So what happens if you buy one of these funds and say you get tired of waiting and so you want to sell that ownership of the fund to somebody else? Well, that also becomes a little sticky. It's at the discretion of the holder. And if they do decide that they will do that, 
uh, it comes with fees. So you just have to recognize that um, this these platforms definitely provide the seller liquidity, but you're not necessarily getting into a product that's liquid. So I give you that example because I think you can easily understand when we talk about something that is either liquid or illiquid, it's about how easy or how difficult it is to buy or sell. So ODL, yeah, we need these currency pairs between corridors that use XRP as a bridge currency. We need it easy to move in and out of quickly with tight spreads. Ripple has been able to get a few of these major corridors liquid. I want you to listen to Craig DeWitt of Ripple where he talks about one such corridor. This is from the US to Mexico and it is with the help of Bitso. Have a listen to this. This is impressive. I mean, this this is a this is a corridor that's gone from basically 0 to 7% of a 36 billion dollar corridor. It's quite something. Now, in terms of where we were two years ago, it's really amazing to think back that ODL, that this, this payment mechanism I'm talking about, ODL was really re released in kind of the end of 2018. And it, um, it's, sh it, it's somewhat shocking to me, even though I've seen the, the rise of this, somewhat shocking that you can go from zero to having a sizable market percentage of one of the largest corridors in the world in such a short amount of time. That usually does not happen in, in, in kind of payments. Um, what you're going to see, though, is Ripple continuing to build excellent experiences like the one into Mexico, like what we have into Europe, like what we have in the Philippines, into the markets where our customers want to send funds. And as we grow out that infrastructure, as we work with partners like Bitso, like others, um, you're going to see a widening footprint in more and more marketplaces where we're able to offer better experiences that are instantaneously, that are instantaneous and cheap. Yeah, the, the number we referenced before of market capture of 7% is absolutely incredible in such a short amount of time. So, Yeah, it is incredible. That was Craig DeWitt, by the way, that was talking previously. And um, I think he does a great job. I think they should really put him uh, as a communicator because he does such a wonderful job at communicating. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very impressed with his ability. So there are basically 195 countries in the world, and that makes up for more than 30,000 plus flows, inward and outward flows. And safely, you could say that there are 10,000 active corridors. I know I've heard people say up to 20,000, but let's just be on the safe side for the ones that are truly active. There's like 10,000 of them. Ripple is pushing the scale up for XRP around the world. And this is, this is, this is a big, Tall order, but they're getting the job done. And you can see that in a new job posting. This just became available. And this position is going to help develop proprietary tools to monitor liquidity for XRP as they scale the payment products in the new markets around the world. This position will bring uh, XRP liquidity, the core component of making the efficient global payment a reality. That is Ripple's vision, not mine, as it says in here. So I want you to listen to Craig one more time in this because he's looking back to 2015 and you can see how they are going to increase their footprint. Have a listen. Yeah, well, you know, if I can, if I can look back to 2000, if I can look back to 2015, um, I think it, it, it's really healthy to have kind of a longer term view of how this industry has grown rather than even look at things on a six month to a year basis. And in 2015, I'd say crypto in general, and I think Ripple was in this as well, was really good at standing up and saying, hey, this has the potential to change the world. Um, and I'd say what has changed over the last even 18 months is that um, for cross border payments and the work that Ripple is doing, it, it is actually changing, changing the world for some people right now. Um, and what we want to do is we want to increase that footprint um, in terms of lives that it's positively affecting. Because it's, it's really nice at, at the business level to throw around um, 
the market capture that um, that Ripple is able to do with Bitso in Mexico. The way that I think about it, though, is when you break down that market capture, each remittance payment into that market, and that's really where our focus is on the remittance payment, that's a story, right? That's somebody getting more money and a better experience than they would have otherwise. It goes to things like buying groceries or, or paying their rent. And I think the big difference and the big change is that we can actually fundamentally change and improve people's lives, and we want to do it on a much bigger scope. And we know how to do that, and it's taken a while to learn how to do that, but we know how to do that. We have a game plan. And we're going to roll that out into multiple jurisdictions around the world, and uh, we're going to escalate the speed with which we're able to do that. So, you know, I, I love liquidity. Um, I love liquidity begets liquidity. I think success begets success. And the markets where we're seeing that, we're going to replicate that and um, and kind of grow that footprint and improve people's lives in multiple jurisdictions, not just Philippines, Zero, and Mexico, but all around the world. Wow. I love it. We can improve people's lives, and we know how to do it, and we have a game plan. We're going to roll it out around the world, escalate the speed, and mic drop. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, Craig, I think you just do um, such a good job of explaining it. And there is another, another place that is improving and adding and enhancing liquidity, and that is BitTrue. They are really helping the XRP liquidity. And I'm not an ambassador of BitTrue. I am a person who understands the growth and the contribution they have made uh, with a very positive impact. And in their new 21 2.0 white page, the statistics of this XRP centric exchange is admirable. In their beginning, you know, they were challenged big time. But they have made a lot of changes, like a publicly verifiable insurance fund, as well as being the first exchange to reveal their insurance wallet addresses and the amount that they've grown in terms of users. Um, the Bitso exchange just hit the milestone of 1 million users, and BitTrue is at 1.5 million users. So I just think, yeah, I just keep they keep listening to their um, to their people who are who are engaged on their website, and they keep improving. And they are a significant um, player and contributor to the XRP liquidity ecosystem. All right, everybody, we are jumping to the fluff. Yeah, it wouldn't be a fluff without talking about some funny creative food creation here. <laughs> this, is, this is just something I happen to see on Twitter that is being done in Japan. And it's just really, yeah, the time people have to make this creative uh, expression for their uh, everyday food. This is bread. <laughs> I just think it's so cute. And also, too, we're getting a lot of rain. This is the rainy season in Japan. And down south, there's a lot of flooding going on. And not only do people go to evacuation centers, but because of today's um, situation, these evacuation centers are a little bit, uh, yeah, a little scary to get into. So the Takamura Company has brought a new product to the market, and it, it is really ideal for these evacuation situations. They're reinforced cardboard. They're very sturdy, very lightweight, and they can be constructed with no nails, no glue, and you don't need any hardware. And they come in some different sizes. You can see how they set up here. They... Um, come in a size that's considered a one unit for 450 US dollars, or this is a two unit for 800 US dollars, or you can get one that is considered their four unit for $1,500. And you can see that somebody is demonstrating how you can create a, um, uh, a meeting with multiple people inside if you don't have the beds and the desk, but there it's, you know, it's really improving today's safety in this uh, reality that we're living in right now. And they will deliver it to you wherever you are or wherever you need it. I think, gosh, necessity is the mother of invention. And this is just one example. 
And you know, I want to also, today's a special day up in Hokkaido, and I just put the map there so you can see the North Island of Hokkaido. And actually about where this first P is at the top, there is a uh, new museum that just opened today. And it's all about Japan's vanishing culture with its Ainu people. This is the indigenous people of Northern Japan, which is estimated to, well, there's a big range of numbers. If you throw out the high and throw out the low, it seems there are about 13,000 uh, people left that claim to be of the Ainu um, group. And they are, long overdue for a museum up there. And it opened today and it opened in this tiny fishing town of Shiraoi. And it is a town with less than 18,000 inhabitants. And the museum is called Upopoi. And that means singing together in their native language. And I think they're hoping to attract some 1 million visitors. They were, you know, working so hard to get it opened in time for the Olympics that is not coming now this summer. So I really uh, do wish that uh, they are successful because it's a splendid setting. They're on the shores of this Poroto Lake and the space, gosh, they spent a lot of money. The cost of this project was 186 million US dollars. And it's really, yeah, was expected to get a big surge of visitors from the Olympics, but uh, I don't think that's going to be the case. They have a 700 artifacts right now in their exhibition. And if I went up there, I would really look forward to getting some of the embroidery work that is very unique to this group of the Ainu. And also too, I would want to take the Hayabusa Shinkansen, which I've not taken yet. I love trains and I have yet to take this one. They have a grand class, which looks so wonderful to travel in. But you know, the train culture here is getting so amazing. I want to show you, yeah, this is a train. It's a two bedroom suite and it's like an apartment. This is one that runs from Nikko, Nikko to Hakodate. And it's one of the many luxury trains that are popping up in Japan. And just have a look here at the dining room. I mean, it's just unreal, right? I have not done this yet. It's on my wish list and uh, I hope someday to experience one of these luxury trains. I need to do a full fluff segment on this particular train. I've not focused on this one. It looks really spectacular. And then I'm going to leave you with a link to this particular um, YouTube video that has a uh, group of three singing in the looks like maybe grandmother mother and daughter i think so and they're singing in their native language that the ainu people have and the um it's just so unique i just will play just about 10 seconds of it but i'll put a link in the description below <laughs> Oh, let me try that again. So interesting, right? Wow, just so unique. Sounds almost like a bird call or some sort of animal call. I'm not sure. But anyway, that is, um, yeah, I just think it's, it's fun to learn about all these different cultures on our planet still. We haven't totally gone into full globalization mode where we've lost those individual 
traits. All right, everybody, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.